to talk this morning about triggers, and I noticed Sarah is not here this morning. She is the one that kind of recommended this, and this kind of serves as a mirror for me, and my hair is not <laughs> doing too good. <laughs> it looks great. <laughs> so uh, we're going to be talking about triggers, and what I want to talk, I, I'm going to give you a little quote here. Uh, it says, avoiding your triggers isn't healing. Healing happens when you're triggered and you're able to move through the pain, the pattern, and the story and walk your way to a different, <clears throat> different ending. I'm going to repeat that. <clears throat> uh, avoiding your triggers isn't healing. Healing happens when you're triggered and you're able to move through the pain, the pattern, and the story, and walk your way to a different ending. You know, every addict, I don't care what the addiction is, eating disorders, alcoholism, drug addiction, sex addiction, you name the addiction, we all have our story. We've got our story. And in order to recover, we must be willing to give up the, our, our story. Now, and when I'm talking about the story, I'm talking about you know, those bad, awful things, you know. Uh, we need to absolutely acknowledge them and we need to be willing to share our story with other people if it might help them. But sometimes <clears throat> we get stuck in our story. And, you know, it's woe is me, woe is me, bless my heart. We get stuck in the story and we never find a different ending. Uh, and so... I do believe in triggers, uh, particularly for people early in recovery, and I want to go over some, uh, you know, things that, uh, and each one of you, you know, can figure out what your triggers are, uh, you know, but let's go over them and talk about uh, what triggers us, <clears throat> something happens, and what triggers is our brain chemistry. And what it tells, you know, the brain of an addict tells us, go find something to ease the pain or to celebrate. It doesn't even have to be a lot of pain. I mean, if it triggers our brain, then what our brain says is go use. I mean, that is the uh, brain and body chemistry of an addict. And the first thing that addicts of any sort have to do is to realize that uh, this is a brain chemistry uh, disease. And I will promise you that brain can change. The brain is the most magnificent computer ever in, you know, that God ever made. Uh, and I know a lot, some of you on here are very computer savvy. And you think about multiplying that by billions, that is how <laughs> sharp this brain is, this computer in our head, and it can change. You know, we have, when we're in an addiction, we, there's ruts in our brain, and the longer we're in it, the deeper the rut grows. But you know, the marvelous thing is that we can, like step two says, we can be restored to sanity. You know, when it says sanity, what, you know, for the addiction doesn't mean that we're insane in every area of our life. It means that there is a sliver missing in our brain that most people have. You know, they have the, the ability to, you know, eat when they're hungry, you know, maybe have a drink of alcohol. Now, I do not think, and this is my opinion, I do not think Anyone can take hard drugs or prescription drugs uh, uh, without at some point it turning into a problem. And there's a lot of discussion about that in the field about recreational drugs and when, you know, is recreational drugs when it's an addiction. Uh, so my opinion is stay away from drugs. You know, if you are got a health problem and you're prescribed medication, take it like it's prescribed. Uh, no one, I don't believe anyone in the world needs to practice recreational drugs. I don't. I mean, that's my opinion. So uh, I'm talking to people 
<clears throat> that have claimed that they do have an addiction, that they do have an eating disorder, alcoholism, drug addiction, codependency, whatever the addiction is. You know, addiction, uh, I mean, codependency is we get addicted to getting our good feelings outside ourselves or our bad feelings. You know, that's what we get addicted to. And then, uh, you know, how most codependents <laughs> ease the pain of living. Majority of codependents have some form of addiction. They'll do something to ease the pain, whether it's food, internet, alcohol, drugs, or anyway. So, I'm going to talk about uh, to how to identify your tr triggers, and this is particularly early on in recovery. Good morning, Bill. See, <laughs> uh, oh, and and there's Patty. Good morning, Patty, and there's uh, Karen. So anyway, uh, let's you need, you must identify your own personal triggers. Uh, for instance, if you're an alcoholic, fresh in recovery. Uh, if you're out in your community on a walk, if you live in a, you know, I mean, we do have some bars here in Buffalo Gap, as short, as small as our town is, you know. But anyway, if you're early in recovery, and if you walk past a bar and you hear the music and the, you know, uh, hear the eyes tinkling in the glasses, if that triggers you, you know, if your mouth starts watering and your brain says you might go in there and get a drink, change your route, go a different way. It is so simple. Just And then, you know, what we firmly believe in here at Shays is uh, the 12 steps. And the 12 steps work, I mean, they work when nothing else will. And so if you're working a, a good 12 step program, you will have a sponsor. And most people, you know, when they walk in today's time, they'll carry their cell phone with them. So if you walk up on something that triggers you, whether you're an alcoholic, drug addict, eating disorder client, call somebody. Call your sponsor. If she's not or he's not available, call a newcomer. Call somebody. It doesn't matter. Except don't call your mother or your dad. I mean, they'll just say, well, honey, just go on in there and get one. Just, just go get one glass of wine. That's all. Call somebody that understands. Don't call somebody that will agree with you and, and meet you at the bar and get a drink with you. Do not do that. Call somebody in recovery. So, and another thing is stay away from conflict. Uh, I just, you know, I grew up in a house where there was conflict. I thought everybody, <clears throat> I, is that Miss Kitty? Look at Kitty. Good morning. <laughs> but I grew, in, I grew up in a house where there was lots of conflict. And I thought that's how people live their life. You know, you hollered and screamed and cussed and you know, threatened. I mean, I just thought that's how people live. Guess what? Most I've never seen anyone else live quite like that. So, I grew up, I mean, I would argue with a fence post. I, I would argue with a tree. I mean, if something, I mean, I loved a good argument. You give me something and I'll take the other side of it, whether I believe in it or not. If that you know, if that fence is white, I would argue with you that it's black or maybe it's gray, you know. But I, I, that's how I was taught, is to argue and to, uh, you know, demand that you're right. I'll tell you, recovering people, we have to stay out of that stuff. You know, we don't get the luxury of stomping our foot and demanding our way. Now... You know, if you are, and I, I support any movement, I don't care, you know, I mean, people have a right to their opinion. But early on in recovery, what I would say, you leave those, <clears throat> you know, hoorays that carry those flags that do, you know, taking a stand. Normal, healthy people can do that. 
I don't believe addicts can do that, particularly early in recovery. Leave that for another time. Uh, you can support in other ways. Mail them a check. You know, do something by phone. But, but be careful about, uh, you know, taking a big stand for something. And uh, because what you're going to do is give your recovery away. Because it will cloud the brain, you, you know. So, avoid argument. <laughs> avoid, you know, uh, taking these huge stands. And if you do have a difference of opinion about things, keep it to yourself. Keep it to yourself. Because what's going to happen when you start voicing your opinion and you try to get somebody over on your side... Uh, they're not going to want to join you, and then you will feel that conflict, and when an addict feels conflict, what do we want to do? <laughs> we want to use over it. So, uh, so another one is, uh, number two, is <clears throat> realize that early on, you may have some cravings. Now, I don't believe this is my opinion. I believe in a mental obsession. I don't believe the craving is set up until the substance is put in the body. Now that mental obsession, see the brain remembers the sense of ease and comfort that we have gotten out of using a substance, food, overeating, undereating, restricting. You know, we have taught our brain one way. Uh, and so, uh, until, for instance, uh, uh, with a compulsive overeater, <clears throat> you know, you might go somewhere, I mean, I always use a wedding or any kind of uh, social function. And I will tell you, for all of you that have eating disorders, guess what? There, are, there is no good or bad food. There's over food. 240 wonderful foods to choose from. Now, you might have an allergy to certain foods, uh, and what that means is that you have had tests run, and a qualified allergy doctor has given you a diagnosis that you have an allergy to certain food, and all that tells you is stay away from that particular food. And for some compulsive overeaters, they have a real sensitivity to sugar and high carbs. That sensitivity is, uh, you know, one calls for two and two calls for a thousand. You know, one's too many and a thousand's not enough. If you can't, if that sets up a craving for you, all that tells you is you might not be able to eat sugar successfully. Uh, I don't know if you can or not. <clears throat> and but for eating disorder people, particularly your anorexics, they will have a long list of foods that they're allergic to, that they can't eat. And I'll tell you what, that is all about anorexia. And it is, you know, recovery is about <clears throat> you know, where the craving is set up with an anorexic is the longer they starve their brain, the better they feel. That's when the power kicks in. That's when the control uh, kicks in for an anorexic. It's different than with a compulsive overeater. Uh, but for an anorexic, when they start restricting their food, and this is the bottom line for anorexia, it is about one word, and that's control. They may not feel like they can control what's going on in their life, but by gosh, they can control what goes on in their mouth. Uh, so one of the things in recovery for eating disorder people is in alcoholics and drug addicts, any addiction, the big book tells us that after a while, after we work the steps, there will be a time of neutrality that, you know, that you can, the guideline for eating disorders. I don't think it's a guideline for alcohol and drugs, but if you can take it or leave it, like back to that wedding, if you go to a wedding and they're serving those little old bitty pieces of cake, 
you know, if you don't have a resistance to, you know, sugar, and what that means is when you eat one, you want more. You know, you might eat that little piece of cake at the uh, wedding, but then it'll set up that mental obsession. And you can't even make conversation with the bride and groom or whoever's there because you're thinking about what you're going to do. I'm going to stop at the bakery. Uh, and, you know, you won't buy one little bitty piece. You know, you get about maybe an inch square at those weddings. No, nope. when that mental obsession is set up, you'll go by the bakery and buy a whole cake. Or if you're an alcoholic, and people will say, oh, this is the best champagne ever served. How can you pass over a glass? You can drink one glass. Now, an alcoholic in recovery, they know they can't. They know they can't. And, you know, when an alcoholic decides to drink one glass of champagne, that sets up the craving. Uh, and my husband, you know, he's been gone eight years now, but he's, he always said that I would always tell him anything about his story, but just don't forget to sober him up. Uh, but we had one, uh, we ran around with some people <clears throat> in church, there's five couples of us, and we went to a Southern, 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 Southern Baptist Church. And Southern Baptists don't believe in drinking. In fact, we did a quarterly covenant where we would pledge that no alcohol would pass these lips. I don't know if they do that anymore, but that's... So anyway, these five couples, and we always had a big New Year's Eve party at our house because we had the big house. And so, uh, and we were all young. <clears throat> and so these women... You know, they're all just cute, precious, and darling. They grew up in the church. They never tasted alcohol. Uh, you know, you see on TV where people are, you know, uh, cheering in the new year, toasting in the new year and all. So they got together and decided they would buy a bottle of champagne and that everyone would toast the, <laughs> the new year in. <clears throat> now, I didn't have very good recovery in in Al-Anon. I was a member, but not a card-carrying one. I mean, I just kind of was on the fringes of Al-Anon. But anyway, we, they broke out that, at 12 o'clock, broke out that bottle of champagne, and they had these cute little plastic glasses that they had bought that they had seen on TV or something. And so I watched, and everybody took a glass, and some of them said, oh, God, that, that, that didn't taste good. And they set it down. Uh, and some would just take a little sip. I don't think a, one of them drank a whole glass, except, you're probably ahead of me in this story, except my husband. And of course, being the good al that I was, I watched him. I watched him. And that was during the time that he said that he was an ex-alcoholic. And that he and he could he could go months without drinking. But if he drank one drink, you know, he ordered up a drunk. Uh, and so, you know, and usually it would last three or four days, and he'd be gone and all that. So I watched it, and he drank everything that was remaining in those glasses. Plus, he took the bottle, and we were in the big flavoring thing, and he took the bottle and he went into the other part of the house. And that started the binge for him, and I can't remember how long it lasted. Uh, and so that's the difference between an alcoholic and a non-alcoholic. Those others, oh, that just doesn't even taste good. I don't know why people want to drink that. And they went on about the card playing. My husband didn't. So that's the thing. You know, for uh, alcoholics early in recovery or eating disorder people or anyone, be aware of where you go, you have a choice. I know early in my recovery, you know, I belong to a lot of different organizations in town. I don't today because I don't have time or anyway. Uh, but, you know, they were always having luncheons. They were always having banquets. They were always having this or that. I'll say the first year of my recovery, I couldn't go to any of them. And even after that, a lot of times I would eat before I went or I would uh, before I go, you know, and then or I would call ahead to see what they were having, you know. I had to uh, treat my eating disorder uh, like, I used to have a friend that only had one kidney. 
and it was back in the days that dialysis machines were very scarce. She lived 75 miles away from here, but three times a week she had to drive to Hendricks Hospital in Abilene, 75 miles away, three times a week to get on that uh, dialysis machine. Do you think she ever missed a time? Uh-uh, because her life depended on it. Her life depended on it. So for addicts, when we can take on and get convinced that we do have a disease and we take it as serious as if we only had one kidney or if we had cancer or whatever and we treated it with that intention, uh, everyone would get well. I mean, every addict would get well. Sorry to say, there's still a lot of addicts who still die of the, the disease, and uh, there's a lot of eating disorder people uh, who die of this disease, and they die for one reason, uh, and this is my belief, is because they don't get convinced that they have the disease and that they can continue to live life on their own terms and uh, do whatever they want to do around the addiction. Okay, so... <clears throat> uh, Remember, you know, when you go somewhere that you might be triggered, I'll tell you the worst place, I know it was for me, it may not be for you. My folks were so sick, uh, bless their hearts. I mean, they were sick and they said horrible things. And so early in my recovery, I could not go see them very often. And when I did, I had to take someone with me and it was usually a sponsor. I mean, it was always my sponsor. And she would... You know, when they would start in about, well, how much weight have you lost? Well, you know, you're you're doing one more diet. I mean, in here, well, I think you've gained, I mean, they, you know, they'd say things about that. Well, I think you're getting a little plump. I mean, they'd say things to me. And when that would start, my sponsor would say, okay, we got to go. We got to be back in Abilene and so-and-so because we traveled to Odessa. I might stay maybe 30 minutes or an hour. That's all I could do early in recovery. Protect your recovery as if it is the greatest possession you ever own, because it is. Without recovery, what else do we have? Okay, <clears throat> so when you see yourself getting triggered, leave the premises. Do something different. Call somebody. Uh, and then, <laughs> and this is what I would do, practice, get a plan and practice your trigger plan. For instance, uh, early, and I'm not talking about if you have 20 years of recovery. If you've got five years, three years, a year, 10 years, uh, like I said at the beginning, your eating disorder or your addiction is going to get in a state of neutrality. You will be able to go anywhere and be around anyone. Now. I can't, I just choose not to hang out at bars. I choose not to hang out at Baskin Robbins. I just, I mean, I choose, I mean, there's places I don't want to go, you know, but I could if I have a need there. I mean, I could do that. I've been, uh, in fact, I have been in uh, business meetings in bars and I could go and sit there. Uh, but anyway, early recovery, I couldn't. So, <clears throat> Try to get you a plan of action. For instance, going around people that will trigger you. For instance, my folks. If your folks, if it's hard to go around your folks early in recovery, don't go around them. <laughs> or if you do, have a plan. And then practice that plan with your sponsor or someone that's going with you. You know, if they say this, you say this, and then you exit. Practice your plan. Know beforehand what you're going to do. Uh, and then number four is take care of yourself. You know, it's so simple. Addicts, uh, you know, we abuse ourselves in so many ways. We overwork, we overspend, we overcommit, we overdo, overdo, or we underdo. You know, we won't do anything. We lay on the couch and get depressed and full of anxiety and we don't do anything. We're all or nothing people. And so recovery is about learning to live in the balance, in balance. Uh, and, you know, rest when you're tired. Now, I'm going to say this, and I'm going to say eat when you're hungry. Now, for eating disorder people, early recovery, we don't know when we're hungry. I had no gauge at all. So for me, I had to look at food 
as, uh, and I still do pretty much, I have to look at food as uh, medication. You know, if you if I got a prescription from the doctor and he let put on there or she put on there, you know, take this many, this, you know, one every three hours or every four hours, it doesn't say either take it or not take it or take it, take it all at once. It doesn't say that. It gives you specifics. And that's how I say look at food. <coughs> look at it as medication. Uh, and feed yourself, you know, I recommend every four hours. You know, that's what we do at the clients, 8 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 5 o'clock, the snack at night, we call it a metabolic adjustment. And then, you know, most eating disorder people don't know when they are hungry. We don't know. We, we have no, uh, you know, we all have an emotional barometer on the inside of us. Now, in that mo emotional barometer, that anger starts at the bottom and it comes up and up and up and up. And for any addict, our brain will say, well, I know what you can do. If you're an alcoholic, well, go drink. Go drink over this. Go drink at them. Show them. <laughs> or go take a drug. Shoot up at them. You know, or go have a snack. Go eat something. Or starve yourself. Show them. Just don't eat. Don't eat this next two or three meals. Show them. You know, so it's all about using the substance to control ourselves and others. So the main thing is uh, rest when you're tired and then uh, get exercise. Get up off the couch and go exercise. We recommend uh, walking. Now if you want to go to the gym and all that, go for it. Uh, but for eating disorder people, you have to watch that. We can get addicted to anything. It'll change those uh, uh, you'll kick those endorphins in and all. But anyway, exercise is good. Pick your exercise. But also, eat when you are hungry. And like I said, <clears throat> you really can't, you know, mindful eating. I know that's really big in the world, you know. They say just eat when you're hungry. That would be great. But we don't, most eating disorder people don't have a cutoff valve or they don't have a start gap <laughs> valve. So that's why. That doesn't really work so much eat when you're hungry for eating disorder people. Just feed yourself like you're, you would take medication. And then if you eat breakfast about 8 o'clock and at 9.30 you feel hungry, you're not. That's emotional hunger. And then deal with what is coming up. And if it is something really like a knot in your stomach, and it has been there before, you can count on it. That, you know, if it's like big feelings, what we say, if it's hysterical, it's historical. And all that tells you, if you've got big feelings and if it is hysterical, you get over, I mean, just uh, over something, mark it down. That is historical. You've gone, something's upset you and you've gone all the way back and picked up that crap that you haven't worked through and all that tells you is you've got more work to do and that's why we do this four day intensive here at Shades of Hope because not everyone needs impatience, some do, a lot of people do, but a four day intensive, you go back and you get your history straight and look at where you have any form of abuse do your anger work, your shame work, you know, and bring it up to today and it's about growing ourselves up if you're still blaming the sorry state of your affairs or your eating or your drinking or your drugging or whatever it is if you're blaming that on your childhood on your parents you have some work to do because it was their fault back then guess what it's not today you need to do your work and then bring it up to today and say that shouldn't happen to dog let alone a kid but so what now what today i am responsible for myself the sorry state of my affairs and the good in my life okay so another thing is uh in that taking care of yourself also halt don't get too hungry angry lonely or tired those are key things with any addict you know get, getting to hungry addicts many of your alcoholics and addicts come in that are malnourished 
because they drape their uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner and snacks in between, and they come in, uh, I mean, very deprived of appropriate vitamins and nutrients, and you know, uh, and so that get, getting hungry feeds yourself appropriate, regardless of the addiction. And then uh, ang anger, uh, that's something, anger and resentment, it's okay to be angry, but when you take that on and you're gonna do something about it and you let it just pull you down, uh, that is uh, something, a feeling that addicts can afford. We, we, we don't get that luxury. When you get angry, you must deal with it like that. Call your sponsor, run it through the sponsor and see what part that you played in it. Because when you're having conflict with someone, I'll tell you, 100% of the time in your adult life, you've played a part in that. And that's when you need to look at your part. And I say 100% of the time, if you are being abused, get yourself out of the abusive relationship. That's your part. You know, hit me one, shame on you. Hit me twice, shame on me. And it's not that simple. I mean, the hardest people to, that I've ever worked with have been people that have suffered from domestic violence because they connect so much to their abuser. So anyway, don't get too angry and lonely. Loneliness, deep in the heart of every alcoholic is what the big book says. Deep in the heart of every alcoholic. And I believe that's true for eating disorders, any addiction, is the feeling of loneliness. The feeling of the loneliness. The loneliness. And the next sentence or two, <laughs> We're lonely, but guess what we want to do? We want to isolate and be by ourselves. And when we isolate and we're by ourselves, we're in poor company, particularly if we're in a bad place. And so, you know, get out of the house. Go do something. Call somebody. Go do something for someone else. If you want to buy yourself some insurance, uh, go do something for someone else. And a good thing that I learned in al do something for someone else without being found out. Because codependents live their life of wanting to do things for other people, caretake other people, but they want to pay off. There's a string attached. When you have an untreated codependent, they'll do and do and do and then get so resentful. Well, look what all I've done for them, and they didn't even invite me to that party or whatever. Codependents, <clears throat> so anyway. Go do something for somebody else for free and for fun without being found out. And then don't get too tired. Tiredness is a, I mean, it is a precursor for any addiction at all to get back in it. Uh, and do not test yourself. <laughs> don't hang out in the same old places that you've been before or around the same people. You know, what we say is in recovery, change playmates, play pens, and play things. Why would you want to be around people that are using all of the time if you're clean and sober? Why would you want to go? Now, sometimes we do have to go to family gatherings where there's a big spread, and you can do that. In recovery, you can go to those places and set up boundaries. It's all about boundaries and have enough self-esteem to set a boundary if you go to, uh, you know, go to a dinner party and I just love early recovering people. I mean, you get someone that's, and I know I had to be strict with the food, but I'll tell you, I did not put it on anybody else. I, I mean, that was my, that's what I had to do. Don't go to dinner parties and tell, oh, well, I can't eat that, I can't eat that. Keep it to yourself. If you can't find anything at that dinner party to eat, if they have let it, I mean, eat, eat salad or whatever, or call ahead of time and just check it out. Just say, I'm on a food plan, and will it be all right if I bring so-and-so? And if you're gonna bring so-and-so, bring enough for the whole table, you know, because invariably, if you show up with your, you know, absent meal plan, they'll want some of it. They will, well, what are you eating? Well, they all want some of it. So, you know, take care of yourselves. If you're going to a picnic or something, uh, take what you can eat, but also take a little bit for other people. So, anyway, uh, 
Another thing with eating disorder people, don't talk numbers. We love numbers. Well, what size are you wearing there? Well, uh, how much do you weigh? How, how big are you around the waist? Uh, you know, we're more than the number on the scale. If someone's asking you how much you weigh, that is a boundary violation. And if you're asking someone what they weigh or what size they wear, you know, now if it's your new, you know, if it's your best friend, you know, best friends talk about a lot of things. But to just in general conversation when you're sitting around, don't ask, don't stay out of the numbers game. For anorexics, it's particular. And they thrive on that. They thrive on it. <clears throat> and what they'll do is that they'll look and size up somebody's body and compare their body to that to someone else's. Uh, and if the person is naturally thin, if they're healthy and they're a thin person, the anorexic will think that they're not thin enough. Uh, and so don't get caught in that numbers game with anyone. It's not anybody's business. Uh, so... Quit giving your triggers too much power. When you turn your will in your life over to, uh, you know, walk down the street and you pass a, whatever, pass a ice cream bar in the hot summertime. If you're triggered, uh, don't give it power. If you... You know, and, and I want to tell you, you might be able to successfully eat a dip of ice cream. I don't know what your brain chemistry is, but don't give it so much power. And don't, t you know, don't uh, wring your hands and woe is me, oh, I can't eat that. You know, carry an apple in your pocket when you go out with other people. Carry an orange, carry some, you know, whatever safe food is for you. But let me tell you, there's over 240 different wonderful foods to choose from. And unless you have an allergy of the mind and body, you can choose to eat most any food that there is. Now, for compulsive overeaters like me, I was a volume addict. It didn't even have to taste good. I just had to have a lot of it. So that is where we have to really watch with the weighing and the measuring. So, going back to this, <clears throat> avoiding your triggers isn't healing. We can avoid them, and we recommend early recovery. Be aware of them. Be aware of them. Uh, and you can't avoid them forever. There is a world out there to live in. Uh, and the true healing happens when you're triggered and you're able to move through the pain. Now, when you're able to move through the pain, you know, self-pity, when we can't have certain things or we can't drink like that person or whatever, self-pity occurs and we start feeling sorry for ourselves of what we can't do. And self-pity is, poor me, poor me, pour me another drink or pour me another milkshake. Pain is real. Pain is real. And when you're around you know, your substance, if some pain comes up, face the pain and grow through it. You're, if you will go through that pain and face it. And any time that you have a big trigger of wanting, you know, to use any kind of substance, I'll give you a hint, it's never about the substance. It's never 100% about the substance. It's what's going on inside of you. Where are you irritable, restless, and discontented? Where are you not getting your way? What, you know, where are you being abused? And, you know, and abuse will do this. And I'm not downing abuse. If you're being abused as an adult, that's on you. And get help for it. Uh, and so stop giving your uh, triggers power. Uh, there is a power that is greater than any of us. And we firmly believe here at Shays in this my own absolutely belief system that any addiction, and eating disorders, anorexia, bulimia, compulsive overeating, alcohol, drugs, you know, porn addiction, sex addiction, you name it. <clears throat> it's a spiritual problem because what we do 
we began to worship the substance. And we began to worship it. We have to have it. We have to find a way to get it. And we forsake all other things in our life for that substance. Don't give your triggers power. God can and will heal any area of our life that we're willing to surrender to. I always say this, the God that I believe in is a gentleman. He is not, he's capable of just making us all robots and, you know, we could be sugar-free, alcohol-free, this free, that free, but he gives us a free will. Misty and I just read that in our morning meditation. He gives us free thinking, a free will. And what he says is, he doesn't come in where he's not invited. If he's invited to the center of whatever your conflict is, he will show up. And I believe, I mean, that's what's got me through a lot of, of early triggers or early temptation. And, and I had to live an entirely different life for the first couple of years of my recovery. Uh, and now I can go anywhere. There's just places I don't choose to go. I'll tell you what, I have myself surrounded by recovering people. I love recovering people. I love all people. I can be around normies, <laughs> but I don't like to be around active alcoholism or drug addiction. or uh, And I can be around people that's active in an eating disorder. Uh, and if they're not my client, I'll keep my mouth shut. Uh, but it bothers me. I'm very concerned for them. And it saddens me to watch somebody with an eating disorder killing themselves a day at a time. But it's not my business unless they invite me into it. So that's what I have. And, uh, you know, like this... Uh, I'll say healing your triggers, <clears throat> avoiding your triggers isn't healing. Healing happens when you're triggered and you're able to move through the pain, through in the pattern and the story and walk your way to a different ending. Our stories must change and we must have a different ending. Uh, and that's what recovery brings to us. All right, that's what I have. Any questions, comments? Sarah, I'm glad to see you. Uh, I was uh, concerned that I hadn't seen you for, uh, on here for a few minutes. So uh, who would like to share about triggers and if you, and what you do about it or if you do have triggers and do you get, does it trigger you into relapse or is it just an awareness? You know, it's like uh, I have, it's better that I have always had a fear of snakes. I used to couldn't see a string. If I saw a string, I'd think it was a snake and I'd run two blocks. I'm literally, I'm not, it's, it was more of a phobia. Uh, but you know, today I have a respect for snakes. I've worked through that, that complete, you know, abnormal fear about it. Now I'm not a snake handler and I don't want to be around them. I avoid snakes at all costs because that is, uh, I mean, they're, they're poisonous, you know, and I mean, any snake, I avoid any snake. I'll tell you this, it's like that little girl had a basket and she was going up, <clears throat> this is how, what triggers are. She was going up to the top of this uh, hill, this mountain to, play, to pick uh, berries, blueberries, blackberries, I don't know. She had this little basket and when she picked her basket up, there was a rattlesnake sitting there. And the rattlesnake said, you know, it's so hot and I'm tired. Can I crawl up in your basket and will you take me up to the top of the hill? Uh, and she said, no, because you'll bite me. And he said, I promise I will not bite you. And that's what our triggers tell you. You can have one. I'm not going to bite you. So the little girl lets the snake crawl up in her basket and she gets to the top, top of the hill. Sets the basket down, the snake gets out, curls up, strikes her, and bites her. And what she said was, you told me, you promised me that you wouldn't bite me. And the snake says, yeah, but you knew what I was. You knew what I am when you put, put me in that basket. That's how triggers are. When you are triggered by you, something in your addiction, you know, you know what it is. You're not an idiot. You're not blind you know that that is a, a door into your addiction or back into the addiction. So, all right, who wants to share about triggers or how you have overcome them or what you do? Who's going to be first? <clears throat> 